Thank you all for joining us. I'm Samantha, um, and we have here Jolenta, Kristen, and Mia, who is the managing, you know Jolenta and Kristen, so they're the co-hosts, and Mia is the managing producer um, at Panoply and for this show. Um, to start off, uh, in this episode, you guys talked about how none of your friends wanted to drink leak water with you, and it was a sort of lonely experience. Mm -hmm. So we thought we could set the record straight here and just have a sort of group friend experience of all drinking. We don't have literally leak water, unfortunately. We have kind of imitation leak water, which I believe is watered down green juice, but should be <laughs> as gross, maybe. We'll see. Um, so maybe gross. we can play Smells that bad. clip of, of the no friends <laughs> and think about how we're, we're doing it differently here tonight, being friends drinking leak water. <laughs> and then the next day, I went to my friend Tamika's baby shower, oh. and I didn't cheat once. And let me just tell you, socializing while you're not allowed to eat is fucking hell. Oh, totally. I, li I joked that this book was called French Women Don't Have Friends during the, <laughs> during the, the tough weekend. Because I, I literally invited people over for leak water, and no one, <laughs> everyone Surprise. declined. Surprise! <laughs> Surprise, nobody wants to hang out with you. <laughs> what it, what, how does this compare? Because you've had both. It's... It's much more flavorful. Yeah, it's pretty than, good. Than the I leak think, water. This actually. is this tastes like watered down like apple juice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so it's okay, not so good though. No, no, no it's not good it's not at all. I don't. I'm, I'm never touching anything similar to leak water again. I said I wouldn't do it. I'm not gonna do it. Um, so just to give you a little backstory on what Podcast Club is for those of you, has anyone been to one of these before? Oh, okay, great. Um, so the idea is that it's supposed to feel kind of like a book club. Um, that's why we choose one specific episode and tell all of you in advance so that we can all be on the same page and have a, more of a discussion. So not, not a straight, just we sit up here and, and talk to each other, but we want you to participate. Um, so we'll start by talking to each other a little just so that you guys can, can drink and, and get ready. Um, but then I would love to open it up um, as soon as you're ready. Um, and we'll talk about the episode that you've all listened to. Uh, but before we get to that episode, I just want to back up a little bit to the birth of this podcast, which is, I think, in some ways more interesting than the way a lot of podcasts are born because it was part of a whole um, pilot project. Um, so do you guys want to talk a little bit about how it came to be? Yeah, sure. So, well, I'll backtrack even further than that, actually. So a couple of years ago, my lovely, very good friend Jolenta said, Kristen, we should totally host a podcast together. And this is what my idea is. You know all those self-help books that I'm kind of obsessed with and curious about? What if we hosted this show? And since you think self-help books are stupid, and since I love them, maybe we can like make a show about this. And I loved it, but I was wildly busy at the time. And actually, you were super busy too, so it was this wonderful dream that just there was no time for. And then fast forward a year or two, and then I was working at Panoply with this wonderful woman here, Mia, our managing producer. And the uh, we launched this thing called the Panoply Pilot Project internally. And all of us on staff were encouraged to bring ideas to the table. And four final ideas were chosen to be made into pilots that the public could vote on. And so Mia was instrumental in the process of helping us make a pilot. And she and Cameron, who some of you may know his name if you listen to buy the book, um, Cameron, Mia, Jolenta, and I spent many hours trying to make our debut episode, which was on The Secret. And then the public voted, and we were very happy and very fortunate that we were voted for. And I, uh, so this was actually my first task when I started at Panoply a little over a year ago, and I was basically just given this list. They had already kind of gone through the initial pitch process internally, and I was just kind of handed this list of probably 20 ideas, I want to say, uh, and this one totally stood out, and I was basically tasked to pick, you know, four or five that we wanted to actually try to make. Um, and this one totally stood out. My, I, I've been in podcasting for a very, very long time, and my criteria is that it just have a little spark of something different. And I had never heard of anything like this. It was the, the idea of it being a part reality show and part, you know, part podcast and part interview show. Um, and so I was just really taken with it. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, it kind of, it, it sort of took off in a way that I, I didn't necessarily expect, but it's something new. Yeah, and we have to give you a lot of credit, Mia, because Mia was saying, don't be afraid to be vulnerable and honest in this. And I think that initially, Jolenta and I, our instincts were to be like, let's make fun of some of these things and right, let's go right. in, let's go in straight out of the gates talking about why this 
is worthy of being made fun of or not. And Mia's like, no, you're going to save that till the end of every episode and start every episode just going straightforward, just explain the book, then tell your stories and live by them, and the comedy will naturally bubble to the top just by us being us. Hmm. Well, and part of it, too, is the idea of them actually, like, living their lives. So, like, I, I just, I've just heard way too many studio-based shows. Right. There are like a thousand of more than many, many thousands of them. Um, and the idea that this would actually take place in their lives at home with their partners, just going about their life in a way that felt really that is really unscripted. And then they would come in the studio and like, I mean, their scripts are their scripts are written, but they are also conversational. And, and that combination, I thought, was really important. And so just talking to them about how to incorporate the tape that they get at home with the studio scenario like that was something that we had to spend some time working out um, but I feel like they they do it to a really good effect I am a, not just the managing producer but I am a number one fan <laughs> of the show I'm, I'm also a fan and I've recommended it a lot and one of the things I like about recommending it is that it's very easy to describe it's a very clear premise um, as opposed to like S Town where you're like it's a it's a town. Yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Um, but did you guys in that early process did you spend a long time kind of workshopping that premise or was it really the same thing that two years ago Jalenta just kind of tossed out there? So uh, during the pilot project I just said to Jolenta, Jolenta, I, I don't want this idea to die. Let's bring it forward. And I did my very best job of having a lot of pizzazz and presenting it to everybody on staff. And I didn't really know what was going to happen until Mia came on board and Mia immediately was like, I love this and I could not tell before Mia came on board if anybody was going to do anything with it. But then the actual process of making the pilot, do you remember the one line that you retook about 800 times over and over and over and over and over and yes, over and over yeah, again? Yeah. What, what is it? Do you ever feel like this? Yes. So, <laughs> oh, I forgot about that's that. That's the opening line of our pilot episode <laughs> on The Secret. And Mia had to, went to retake this line, I don't know, 30. <laughs> what, what was wrong with times. it? I don't know. <laughs> it needed to not sound presentational. It needed right, to sound right. sincere. But this was a studio moment where, we're, you know, I, I, I don't know if people are podcasters, but you have to you have to really craft the thing, at least the first episode. It has to, you know, as natural as you want it to sound, there are so many, many, many hours that go into doing that and making it sound supernatural, especially in those studio moments. Like, the, that, the at-home tape was easy, but to make it sound sincere in studio was tricky. And, and yeah, for whatever reason, that line... <laughs> what was like, the this? Do you ever feel like... What? It was uh, like that a it was case, then right? we it was... threw the tape of me like crying about hating my life. Oh, like, okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. It was okay. establishing it was Jolenta just as, a, like as a her character setup. on the show. <laughs> right. Because right. we needed to set up like who is Kristen? Like if you've never met them before and you've never heard this show, who is Kristen and who is Jolenta? And we needed to make that happen in a way that didn't feel like, hi, I'm Kristen Meinzer and I'm from Minnesota and right, blah blah blah. Right. Like it needed to, you know, it needed to feel visceral and you needed to buy in really, really fast. Well, I'd love and that to hear so from you guys. Do you guys feel like you know Christian and Jolenta from listening? How long did that take? In one episode? In more than one episode? Two? Do you want to, like, wh who are they? Uh, <laughs> 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 but it felt very like comfortable like I already was part of your circle or you were already part of mine did you think I'm I'm a Kristen or I'm a Jolenta or like did the two of you play that game oh, oh. thanks um I I think I, I have some of each of you in me. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I generally think of myself as like a pretty sort of like type A, like serious organized person, which I feel like is more on your side of things. <laughs> um, <laughs> but <Whatever>. I also, <laughs> I I also see in myself a lot of the kind of like optimism about some of the books that you guys tackle, which I think it connects more obviously with you, Jolenta. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So yeah, so, some of each. <laughs> what about anyone else? Are there are there other Kristens or Jolentas? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you don't want to identify yourself. So, so. <laughs> yeah. 
Well, I uh, know Jolenta personally, uh, but I feel like I know her a lot better after listening <laughs> to the podcast, oh, no. uh, which is pretty fantastic because she's awesome to begin with. Uh, but Kristen, Thanks. I had no idea who you were, uh, and I listened to the podcast on uh, 1.5 speed, or uh, you know, some people probably are better than me and can even listen to it at double speed, but you get through it a lot faster, which is great. Uh, but I, uh, I, because of that, I am, have you ever seen um, uh, Crazy Ex-Girlfriend? Uh, you know the mm-hmm. best friend in Crazy Ex-Girlfriend, the red-headed woman? I imagine that you, Chris and Meisner, like, were the red-headed best friend at Crazy Ex-Girlfriend. <laughs> and then I looked you up on Twitter, and I was like, oh, no, she's definitely not. And then I listened to <laughs> <laughs> uh, But I, uh, I, I just met your husband, Brad, uh, outside earlier, too, and he's kind of exactly what I imagined, which is pretty so fantastic. So Brad is actually Dean, husband. Dean. Oh, my God, Brad is your That's husband. That's your lifelong <laughs> friend. Who is, who is my best friend? <laughs> <laughs> Remember when you were the best man at our wedding with Brad? <laughs> <laughs> His signature cocktail is strong. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Um, so staying with the birth of the show for one minute, uh, who came up with the name? So when I was doing the initial pitch and the song and dance in front of the staff at Panoply, I said, we will literally and figuratively live by the book in each episode, by the book, Jolenta and Kristen. And I didn't mean it as the title, but Andy Bowers, who's the chief content officer, was like, that's the best name of a show. That is a really good job, Kristen. And, and I didn't actually mean it, but it worked. And then it I would say that was not on any of our lists. Yes, oh, it was not what, on our what list What were you considering? I was them? rooting for self-helpless. Oh. <laughs> but no one else seemed to like it as much as me. <laughs> I guess it's a little pessimistic, <laughs> like inherently, but I liked it. I like it, yeah. yeah. That was that's on that's the only one I remember. Self help me, I think was one of them. There, there mm. were a couple of different self helpish sort yeah. of titles. Okay. Yeah. And what about the theme song? <laughs> Which I gotta say, like, I kind of hate. Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh but but it's I, it's like it's catchy, right? It's, yeah, yeah no. it's distinct. <laughs> the theme song. I mean, we had very little to do with it. I emailed my friend Nate, who's a wonderful composer. You should look him up, natewaita.com, uh, and said, "Kristen and I love Dolly Parton, and we're starting a self-help book, or starting a podcast about living by self-help books." And so that was supposed to be Dolly Parton inspired, and I, I was just like, we like like bluegrass, we like Dolly, we like. I gave him a we, few we other. Like, we, we like, like Kesha's Savage's new open, album. Oh yeah, we like. like I also just sent him the most horrible references. Okay. Yeah, we also mentioned Dan Savage's theme song. Oh yeah, yeah. we did. Okay. Yeah. Um, so and, and that's what we got. And that's what we got. I love it. I love everything he makes. Um, and then this year we had him just vamp it up a little bit and use a female voice because we were like, we're women. We should have women singing him about us. Mm. So that's or w- how what a theme song was born. People pro theme song. It's very divisive. Is yeah. it? Yeah. Some people really on their Facebook it page. Really it's, like, like it. ah, it's like I like I like the Stephen Tune version. Yeah. The woman singing. Yeah. That yeah. we've been getting a lot of positive. Well, when we first started, everyone just hated the theme song, oh. a la <laughs> Samantha Henning. Sorry. <laughs> um, but then the I'm not full hate. Yeah. I can see its appeal. And like we would get, we got a really good email from one person. Um, I'm going to paraphrase, but she was just like, look, I hate your theme song so much. Like, and I am a normal, like rational person who li- <laughs> like who lives in a city and has a job. And like, I can't believe I'm writing you to say I hate this theme song. But like, that's how much I like your show, but also hate the song yeah. and so we really started taking it to heart but of course then the second we change it we just started getting a bunch of messages about like no oh my god like what happened but yeah people were outraged we had a lot so. of people who were upset when we changed it and um the original theme song one of the things that cracks me up the most is if you look at our apple podcast reviews so many people i shouldn't say so many people but for the longest time, the only negative reviews we got were either because of our swearing mm. or because of the theme song. I love this show but. so much, but because of the theme song, I can only give you one star. Like that's <laughs> how that's <laughs> how divisive that's how bad it, it was. Is. Yeah, wow. I didn't know there were people who were just like middling, like you guys, where you're like, I oh, know it's a song. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so let's dive into this episode. Um, 
and starting with this book. Uh, Kristen, you said something in the episode. You said, uh, I only agreed to do this book because it's a diet book that actually mm -hmm. encourages a healthy relationship with food. Are there books that you vetoed? And what, what's that process like of choosing what books to talk about? Oh my gosh. We always have an ongoing oh, list yeah. that we keep that we always add and delete from and add and delete from. And some of the books are just like, Mike the Situation in Sarantino's, like um, we had him on the list and we, now we just use his book for live shows. We've had a number of like, oh God, there's so what many are, books on the list. so many the, that have like come and gone. Yeah, the Goop book. Um, are but, you trying to do books that people, that are, that are sort of zeitgeisty? I would say for the first season especially, we wanted, like I was sort of going for like those books your mom's like friend is always like recommending to you. Mm -hmm. That like in the back of your mind, you're like, you know that might help, but like I'm never gonna pick it up. Like I wanted to pick those up for you. Yeah. And do you picture that people at the end should want to buy these books or read these books? Or um, feel like they don't have to? I don't think we, I mean, one of our little mottos we say internally is we read the books so you don't have to, or we live right. by them so you don't have to. But. Yeah. We are amazed by how many people write to us after each episode and say, I'm buying it right now. Or alternatively, we have these mini episodes where we read listener mail and we tell you what our next book is going to be. A lot of people write to us after that, too, and say, buying the book now so I can read it with you. So some people hmm. take it as a book club where they read the book with us and then they tune into the episode to find out. Uh, how we interpreted all the rules versus how they did it for themselves. Right, and so it's always fun to hear from people how they're treating it like a book club. However, we need to create a system so we get a cut of that. Like every time somebody buys yeah, a book. Amazon affiliate link. Yes. I think Slate does that. Okay, let's, let's get on that. Let's we get on should that. have some people there. About yeah, that. let's get on that. Yeah. Um, did anyone here read it either before or after listening? Well, it's a smart crowd. No, wow, know better. no one. Yeah, no you guys one. are smart. Does anyone <laughs> want to? Yeah. More after listening? Yeah, I think it really just like reminds them of the book, like especially like near the end. Like, right, right. Um, so I really did watch like what you said about like having felt about the body beforehand versus afterwards. So. And have you have you <laughs> have you bought or read any similar books before, or would this be a first foray into self help? Definitely a first foray. I just feel oh, like no. I can't get into self help because I need to know the ending. So. But I feel the like ending now I know is, the ending. is betterment, I think. Right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Total perfection. It's so vague. <laughs> yeah. Hold on, you've never been on a diet before? I've been on diets, but uh. oh, never with a book is never with a book. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. I was gonna say, oh, you'd be the first woman I've ever met who's never, <laughs> oh, yeah. and that would be amazing. <laughs> well, yeah, and so Kristen, you talk. I mean, both of you talk quite a bit about your personal histories with dieting and body image. Um, we have a clip actually of Kristen, uh, you talking about your history. There we go. Bon appetit, my love. Take a bite. Oh, oh that's no, a different that's clip. That's me feeding Bradley. Yeah. <laughs> so I grew up in a household where my entire life, the number one most important thing for a woman was to be thin and to be pretty and I do not remember a time in my life where my nana and my mom and my aunts were not on diets. And I don't remember a time I wasn't on a diet either from the time I was nine or 10 years old. And that continued pretty much all through my childhood, my college years. I did extreme things to try and stay thin. I would gain the weight back. I would throw up the weight. I would do everything I could to try and stay thin. And so my weight fluctuated a lot between 100 pounds and 140. It could be both those weights in a three-month period, or it could wow. be staying at 100 pounds for a while. It could be up at 140 pounds for a while. That breaks my heart. It, it was oh, bad. It but is hard. It, being a woman with a body, like those expectations start weighing on you. Really so young. young. It's oh, insane. It's the worst. So I feel like that is some, like that alone could be a whole podcast, just talking about you know, women oh, and their bodies, yes. yeah. and Never probably <laughs> there are several of those. Um, I mean, how do, how do you guys think about how much of your own stories to put in there? Is there anything that's kind of off limits because it's too personal? Um, and then I'm also curious from all of you, like how, um, how that affects the way that you listen to be hearing those kind of intimate details from the hosts. Well, that was terrifying. It was really horrible and hard for me to do that. And Mia and Jolenta and Cameron were so encouraging and so respectful about the story. They didn't try to push me into doing it, but they said it would serve the story if I would just be honest about everything. 
and before the episode came out, I was terrified, and uh, somebody that we're friendly with in the office who is very active in um, disordered eating communities, and uh, it, she kindly offered to listen to it and give her feedback on it, mm -hmm. and then um, that made me feel better that she felt that the story was being respectful and that me revealing myself was good for the story. That, um, But that was terrifying. That was the scariest thing I'd ever put on tape up until that point. Mm -hmm. And since then, I've put other things on tape that are probably just as scary or not scarier, and things on tape that <laughs> Joel might just look at me because we were just in, the, I can't tell you the book, but there's this episode that like is coming out in a couple of months and there's a scene of me and Dean in a tub together and Joel Lenta. I just heard the tape. And, and Joel and jo Lenta, jo Lenta and Cameron were like covering their faces and just horrified while we were in studio. Like, I don't know if we can listen to you and Dean in a tub together. It's just too much. It's too much. It's too much. I can't stand it. Well, so does that mean that it might not make it in? It may, it may. We need Mia to listen to it. Yeah. This is why you say, need the managing yeah, Cameron producer. Cameron did say I needed to listen to this yeah. one. They very rarely call on me these days because they've kind of found a groove with like what works. But this one, this, this one, one yeah. apparently I need yeah. to hear. I, I have think, not heard it yet. <laughs> yeah, I think once... I don't know, for at least me, I also work as a comedian, so, like, for me, most things are, like, nothing's off limits as far as, like, my material <laughs> s until I hit a limit. It's, but I would say you, I usually find the limit once I've gone past it. <laughs> but, like, that's what editing is for. Yeah. <laughs> so there have been things that you say into a microphone and then you say, we can't use that, that's too... I think I have yet to hit that point. You've only done it to me with this bathtub scene. That, like, yeah, I would say this that, is yeah. the only one where I'm like, I don't know if I'm immature or like this is too much. <laughs> but, yeah. I feel like I feel like your vulnerability is so key to the show, and it's something that I really connect to, and something that I think makes it really special. And because you went there like so early on in the show and so hard, mm -hmm. it's kind of like anything after that is almost easier, right. right? Like you you just went right for it, especially with this book and especially with something that is so complicated and relatable and you were so open about it. I feel like you really just made everything else okay. Not everything, I'm sure, mm. there, I'm sure there will be a limit at some point, but like you made so many other things so okay and you really allowed listeners in in a way that I think few other shows do. And I think that's something that's really special about what you guys do is that you really are so open and so available to just expose the deepest, darkest parts of yourself. And I think that's one of the reasons that I love it so much. Well, I, I'm really appreciative that everyone was so encouraging for it because in the past I've been a critic, I've been a producer, I've been a lot of other things, but I definitely was not somebody who ever put my own story out there at all. Mm -hmm. And it was terrifying. It was really terrifying. And now I'm glad we do it. And yeah. Yeah. Good. I'm glad I, sometimes we do it. I worry I like forced you to become a performer. <laughs> <laughs> like we all know I'm an exhibitionist. Or you know, like yeah, like I go <laughs> Like, my ideal job is to like, get paid to stand by myself and, like, tell people stories about my life. Like, <laughs> you're so good at it, too. But, yeah. yeah. But, what, you know. did, what did you all think about it? Anyone have anything to... Is that a hand or just a hand on a head? It's hand, but it's not related to your question. Oh, okay. That's fine, too. Oh. I was wondering if, after the variety of books you've read at this point, like, are you thinking about writing your own? And if so, like, mm. what tidbits would you have pulled out of all of the books to possibly, like, put together? Are you from a publishing house? Because yeah. we should totally <laughs> talk about this No, but afterwards. I think there's a future here. Well, we, we would love to if somebody would offer us a book. It's a good that. idea. Yeah, I feel we'll like totally it's such dangerous it. territory, too. But, <laughs> yeah. And someone could have a podcast about your book. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> so meta. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Well, no, the, I mean, the other thing, not to be such like a fan of the show, but I am, um, I, I feel like what you guys do isn't just live by it, by these books, but you say really smart stuff about the industry and about self-help and about why we need books like that and why it all matters. So it's not just, you know, it's not just like, oh, today I, you know, went for a walk and I smiled at everybody, you know, it's like, or today I just ate leeks. It's, it's like, why does this even matter and why does anybody care? And I think that's something that people are connecting with right it's just it's got a bigger that there is a more meta message uh in the show we like to hope so that's yeah. um so in terms of these like boundaries and how much mm -hmm. of yourselves to put out there i, I have so many questions about your husbands <laughs> and uh -huh. their roles um i mean 
I guess to start, it, maybe we can play that clip of you feeding Brad. And Brad, this is something that didn't actually make it into the episode, but is uh, quite delightful. There we go. Bon appetit, my love. Take a bite. You just sort of chop it up like an artichoke, right? You'll probably love it and be like, why are you being a bitch about this? Ow. <laughs> no? Ew. You don't like it either? It tastes like... You're going back for more. It tastes like nothing. It tastes like... Mm. You know how David Blaine's... His pieces of his skin were falling off after he was in that tank of water for a week. That's just, okay, now This is what that skin would taste like. <laughs> Don't! I have to eat this for lunch and dinner. Still. You have to eat David Blaine's Ew. skin all week? Stop! No, not all week. Not Blaine's skin? Stop! That's Make sure you put some lemon on it. That'll change it. <laughs> it just tastes like... <laughs> Blaine skin. That's genius. <laughs> <So> gross. <laughs> um, so when did your husbands become such central characters? Was that part of the deal all along? And was that a negotiation? Or it, I feel like it happened sort of accidentally and naturally, mainly because it's a lot more fun to have a sounding board than to just record, like, audio diary at the end of day one. Yeah. Um, and then sometimes, you know, when it comes to certain books, they, they need to, we need their feedback. When it comes to a relationship book, like, I'm going to want to hear from the person I'm in a relationship with to be like, do you like this? Or like, is this making things worse at home? Or, you know. Right. Yeah. And as Jolenta originally imagined the show, it would be a reality show. Right. And so the main parts of our reality when we go home every day are our husbands. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, we had to. Um, and, and they're stuck with us. Yeah. 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 So <laughs> there, there are times when we'll have conversations that Brad knows are on tape and like in the middle of it, he'll be like, well, you can't use that. You can't use this. You can't have me saying that. Like, I guess he calls limits like in our conversations, but now it's just sort of a part of the conversation. And it, do you, are there times when you talk about it without the tape rolling or is that against the rules? You, you have to record everything. Uh, for the most part, at least in my house, I think I usually have the tape rolling and then he'll be like, you can't use that part where I said this thing or like, can we cut out that part where we had like an actual like real fight or, you know, <laughs> <laughs> we or he'll tell me to stop it before we like have a fight. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, we record, um, you know, pretty much everything we need, but then on top of that, Dean and I will frequently be having conversations where he'll say, why aren't you recording this? It seems <laughs> yes, like it's pertinent, yeah. which um, I really appreciate Dean being so on board and helping with the show. And Dean is not somebody who ever aspired to be on a podcast or in show business either. <laughs> yeah. Well, is, <laughs> it, uh, is it okay if we ask? Dean is out here somewhere, right? Do you, uh, <laughs> could, how, what's your take on all of this and your role in it? <laughs> what's my take on it? Um, I don't think at the beginning I realized how much of our lives would be subsumed by like living these books. Right? It's uh, it's we, we live by these books back to back to back <laughs> to back to back. And some weeks I don't even know what 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 the rules will be, <laughs> which which certainly keeps the relationship fun and interesting. Yeah. <laughs> And did, do you mind being sort of a, a character in that way? I mean, I feel like, like, like I've, I've met Kristen and Jolenta before. I've never <laughs> met you, but I feel, I feel like I know you. <laughs> uh, I don't know you at all. So <laughs> that was a bit weird, actually, just a bit. Um, so it, it's interesting. At the beginning, um, when we were talking about whether or not you know, to do this and, and what this would involve, I, I didn't have any idea of what how invasive it was going to be and the first couple of times were were um surprising i was a bit taken aback by how raw and open you needed to be but very very quickly i embraced that it just felt sort of natural it was easy to i mean kristen's such a wonderful person and easy to talk Aww. to <laughs> uh and the fact that you all have to listen to that i didn't realize quite how big of a speaking part that I would have or Brad would have. Yeah. I thought it would be the occasional quip or you know a couple of things here and there. And then uh, it's definitely grown well beyond what I thought it was going to be. And do you listen? Yeah. 
Yeah. Are there things that you've said that you regret? Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Bathtub scenes in particular. Uh, <laughs> I can't um, wait. No, not really. I mean, no, I, it's just, you know, this is, this is, we're helping people, right? We're, we're explaining what these books are like. Yeah. Yeah, uh, for better or worse. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for for being in it. <laughs> I think your presence in the show, actually, you you and Brad, really just opens up the the potential audience too. Because my husband, for example, who will listen to any show that I'm working on just because he's good like that, um, but this isn't one that he thought that he would enjoy or relate to. And when he listened to the pilot, he's like, well. I really like Kristen and Jolenta, but I love Brad and Dean. And like, <laughs> you guys are the reason that he keeps listening. I mean, he, oh, you know, he, once we get the shows rolling, he doesn't have time to listen to everything. It's, I have to work on a lot of stuff, but li this one is one that he's kept in his queue, and it's really because of you guys. So, I, funny. thanks. Well, we do have some some men, some real live men in the audience. Yeah. Um, <laughs> is that any of you care to speak up about how you feel about the role of the husbands? Real live men. <laughs> we all know who you are. Is that a real? That's a. That's a. Oh yes. Um, we listen to this as homework. Oh, that the mic. Never well, know how oh, to turn the mic on. Okay. Oh, there you go. Um, we listen to this today together, and we have actually done like a juice cleanse once before, which was not a great like husband wife experience. <laughs> oh no. And, um, <laughs> And so we like listened to this and I was like relating to it in all sorts of ways. I'm like foreign, I came to America, I gained weight, I came home, my mother put me on a diet to eat the food that we I grew oh, up wow. eating Where are to you lose from? the weight. I'm from Eastern Europe. Okay. Which like doesn't seem like diet food, but like it did involve <laughs> like boiling vegetables, you know, and eating the soups and it was very like I was like, Yes. And actually, I own the book, which I feel like my mother gave me <laughs> because I have lived in America now for 15 years. Um, but it was really fun to listen to it with him because I would have these moments like, I should do this. This is going to be a great way to restart after the holidays. And he would be like, every time like a dean or Brad segment would come on, I was like, honey, we're not going to make it. <laughs> <laughs> so it, was, it was really fun to listen to it together. Actually, I thought so. That's nice. Did you? <laughs> I have nothing to add other than I told her there's no way both of us can be that hungry <laughs> at the same time <laughs> and survive. Uh, yeah. so, you well. have to take turns being that hungry. <laughs> <laughs> Would you guys recommend? You, how long have you each been married? Uh, I've been married uh, what a little over two years. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I've been married a little over one year, and so that means that most of our first year of marriage, Dean and I were on tape with the show. Wow. <laughs> so would you would you <laughs> recommend? <laughs> Thanks, honey. <laughs> would you recommend this to newlyweds? Um, living like this, <laughs> Jolenta's like absolutely no. Not. <laughs> not even like I don't know. I've learned a lot of things about Brad that I probably wouldn't know. So I guess that's good, right? But I feel like there are way more fun, constructive ways to do it than like one of one person's passion project. <laughs> like, <laughs> has anyone else done anything like this in a relationship? Like done a uh, a weird thing together? with rules that you're both observing? No one? Yes. I got my husband to sign up for a triathlon. Oh, and you so did it together? We did it together and trained for it because he was always talking about, oh, I always want to do one, I always want to do one. I'm like, all right, well, put your money where your mouth is. I'm signing up. How about you? And, um, but it was fun. I mean, it was like... I don't know. We we got to know each other in different ways, and but it's you know it's the exercise, the food. We were all stressed out at the same time. We were trying to figure out what's going on. It, it was it was it was a real journey. Um, and Had you ever exercised together before? Or yeah, was I mean we were thing? active, but we'd never done like races and trained for really something serious. And since then, we've been doing a lot more. We've done a couple of marathons, and oh, okay. and wow. it was kind of a good bonding experience, actually. That's but but you gotta know where you're like-minded and where you have, you know, overlap and in interests too. I mean, yeah. I wouldn't, mm -hmm. you know, just pluck something out of the air to do it. But uh, and 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 we've been married a while too. It's we're not newlyweds by any means too. So it was like, although that triathlon actually was pretty early. I gotta remember that. So. <laughs> but it, it was a fun experience. It was nice. 
I actually made a rule with my husband uh, before we got married that we we couldn't run together because I just there's something like too cute about it. We both run, <laughs> but I just didn't want to do it together. We start together, and then he's much faster than I am. But you know, we're getting up, we're going out, uh-huh. and you're like, all right, you're see suiting you when you're up done. together. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> um, any other just thoughts or questions from anyone? Yeah. Um, oh. So I have a question. Um, a lot of self-help books are about being single and dating, and you guys are not. Um, so I was just wondering if you've gotten like a lot of letters from people, if you've thought if there's a way that you might address that at some point in future episodes, because I don't personally really read self-help books, but I have picked up a couple about like dating and relationships. And yeah, it's just something I've always thought of as I've listened. Yeah, I mean, I have secret dreams of like a third or fourth season where we do a deep dive and just are sort of like mentors to to like two single people and just like force them to live by a bunch of different dating books. <laughs> <laughs> That's my dream. My, That's a dream of mine. I, I love I like that, that dream. I love uh-huh. that dream. But I also have the dream of our mild mannered, very sweet producer Cameron, yes. who is single, of forcing him to live by books like The Game. And mm. I just, I think that would be fantastic. So if mean. We, but he is so sweet. He's never said an ill word to anybody. And to go up to women in bars. He has and, the face of an angel. Yeah, and then to put them down to get them into bed. Like, I, I mean, can't that even was a, actually a reality show. Yeah. Right? That, with mystery. Yes. The pickup artist. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. I watched that show. It was very compelling. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> but as far as single people go, I mean... I've been single most of my life. I won't tell you my age, but it's many, many, many decades that um, I've been single. And so um, I would love for the world to be less focused on you have to find a man, especially women are told this all the time. I, I hate that message. You don't have to find a man to be happy. You really don't. You can be happy in so many different ways, which is sort of the message of our show, too. There are so many ways to be happy. You don't have to do just because somebody tells you you have to be thin because you have to find a man, because you have to have this kind of job, you have to have this much money in your bank account. None of that's true. There are so many ways to be happy. You don't have to have a man to be happy. Do you feel like all self-help books have that element of uh, sort of first planting this idea of you need X to be happy the way that advertisements do? Or are there some that, that have a sort of, that come at it in a different way? I think the diet books certainly do. Yeah. yeah. Every diet book out there. I mean, at the end of this episode, Jill Lent and I made a very, like, very strong agreement that we will never break. We will never do another diet book again. We will never do another diet book again because they are like advertising. Yeah. If you do this ridiculous thing, we promise you this thing will happen, which will never, ever, ever happen. It will never happen. You'll never be happy for the rest of your life because you drink leak water. But it's you might be happy happen. for the rest of your life because you have a delicious uh, dark chocolate square, which you should all also have. <laughs> but only one square, not the right. whole one bar. One square a day. <laughs> yeah. Restraint, people. Do you, like, if you strongly disagree with the premise of a book, does that feel like it sh- you <laughs> therefore so many books. should not do it on the show? <laughs> no, or, I, no, we disagree a lot of the time. Yeah. With, the, with the fundamental... Oh, like, totally. Every, oh, yeah. okay. yes. Can we talk and about men okay. are from Mars, women are from yeah. Venus? Yeah. Yes. 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 Yeah. yeah, we all of the people on stage fundamentally disagree with that book. But you guys found a way to make it relevant or to, li- mm-hmm. to, to, to say something smart about it or to use it and to pull like a little nugget out like in your... Uh, uh, at the end when you sort of do your analysis you know you found a thing in there that made it like not a waste of your time which made it not a waste of the listener's time right like the takeaway at the end of uh, French women is like this is a terrible idea and we will never do this again right that's a great lesson learned (laughs) you know and the same thing with men are from Mars like it just has a it, it, it you know it was like okay we all think that this is complete BS but here is a little thing that I learned. And that, you know, talking about your guys' relationships, like I particularly remember, I think each of you got into a pretty deep argument with your spouse at one point during the, <laughs> during the recording of, that, of those weeks, um, to the point where I got a little bit worried that maybe this was like taking things too far, but you found, you know, you found some relevancy and you found a way to make it, to get a takeaway that felt ultimately positive. Yeah. 
Yeah. It seems like you need, uh, like Mia, you should be like the Truman Show people. Like you should be watching the whole thing. That's exactly yeah. what my role is. Making yes. sure that nothing <laughs> is too too far. Don't let them get to the right wall. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yes. To follow up on that, um, because that episode in particular made me like really uncomfortable. Just the fact that, like, you're covering this book, which I have never honestly read, but like thought of as quite sexist, and and I so appreciated the way that you handled it. But I thought, was there ever a moment where you're like felt super queasy about doing it, or it, or even implementing some of the advice, and how like how did you navigate that? I mean, it was that one was really hard for me. It made me <laughs> made me really resentful of my husband, to be honest. It was tough. It made like I felt like I was reading a book that confirmed a lot of my worst fears about our relationship where it's like it's because you're crazy and like he's always been fine is sort of the message of the book. Like, dude, stay the course, like bitches get your shit in check. So <laughs> Pardon. <laughs> um, <laughs> so for me, it also like played into a lot of my insecurities, which I think made me like want to fight, like pick fights more often too, where it's like, not only did it make me insecure, but I feel like it like, I don't know. I feel like it like tricked me into fighting. <laughs> I say, I'm talking about this book like it has its own agenda, which it doesn't. Yes, it does. Well, I mean, it, I does. it does have right? its own yeah. agenda, yeah. right? Well, and, and it's a does. massive best-selling classic. I was saying that's so, another like, thing I felt so let down that, by was so. it was like the generation above me. It was like the book everyone's parents had and like, I sort of thought of it as a voice of reason and then I read it and was like, oh no, like... <laughs> Yeah, and a either lot of our, I have to like stick to my own beliefs, and this book is bullshit, like, or I'm the reason my relationship's failing. <laughs> and a lot of our listeners are in their fifties and some in their sixties who've actually written in and said, "This book was actually really good for me and my spouse because we were brought up in that generation. That actually is what a woman is, and that actually is what a man is. If you're mm -hmm. a baby boomer, and right. we were brought up to be this way. This is my role." And it spoke to them to hear somebody else talk about it in, in a slightly different light. And we do feel a responsibility in some way, at least in season one, to cover those bestsellers. Why is this book such a big deal? Is it harmful or is it harmful to us in particular? Mm. And so did we have queasy feelings? Yes, we had totally queasy feelings. And if you saw Jolenta and I, if you saw our text messages back and forth, oh. it was hundreds a day of us just saying fuck. It was fuck just us guy. like fuck shitting him. on the book as yeah. much as we could to then like go home and be like, well, the book says I have to <laughs> silently sit down and write a letter to you, love, my love. Like, <laughs> and then we'd be like, this guy's like a fucking tyrant. <laughs> like, so yeah, but it's yeah, it, it makes you queasy, but you do yeah. it. Yeah. How much do you guys communicate um, in advance about about what you're experiencing versus like w when we talk to um, the co-hosts of the Nod, they very explicitly like walk out of the room when the other one is planning a segment, so that when they go into the studio, it's this very natural. I'm hearing this for the first time kind of thing. Where where do you fall on that? I'd say I'd say for the most part we try to keep things separate, uh, but when a book's really hard, we'll send text messages more about like general things. Mm -hmm. Like you know, it won't be like this exact thing happened today, but just like oh my god, I'm so exhausted, and I like hear like you know, I keep seeing this passage like going through my head, or, right? Yeah, I mean, so? we'll write back and forth making fun of the books themselves before we, but we won't talk about how we're living them usually. Yeah, if that makes sense. So. You know, with Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, it was really easy to take one pull quote after another, put it in a text message and say, fuck this fuck. And then <laughs> just do that over and over and over again. And we just did that back and forth for days. And she just sent me quote after quote from the ebook, And I was like, I'm reading the same book. Like, I'm also angry. Like, it's OK. <laughs> yeah. I get it. Uh, well, one case where that was different was um, during French Women Don't Get Fat, right. I actually was thinking of quitting the show entirely. Whoa. Um, I was having such a horrible time, and you can hear in the episode, I think you could get some sense of how horrible it was for me. And I would go and we have these phone booths at my office, and so you can have private conversations because we have an open floor plan. It's very hip office, you guys. <laughs> it's very hip. So <laughs> you can go into one of these phone booths, and no one can hear you scream or cry. But I would call Jolenta up several times a day crying, saying, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this. I can't do the show, I can't do this book, I can't do this. 
um, it was making me crazy. I was weighing myself 20 times a day, 50 times yeah. a day, 100 times a day. I was writing down not just like every single calorie, but like adding up things. So I mean, I mean, I was just going insane. I can't even tell you the extent of how I went into a horrible place with this book. And so that was one case where we did talk a lot. Where I would be like, you need just like eat a snack. It's an emergency. Like you're having it. Like like yeah. and. And Jolenta also, she also was like, if this is what's happening, we don't have to do right. this. Right, I'll be like, you can stop. Your experience of the book can be like, it's too much. And like, I can finish. Like, it just, yeah. like, it is, it, your experience is valid, like, regardless of if you finish the two weeks or not, in my opinion. Yeah, but I me also, being me, like, I'm just like, I started it, I have to finish also, it. <laughs> we see rules very differently. <laughs> <laughs> but, but then it, it sounds like it didn't haunt you once it was over you were able to oh it haunted me after for weeks and weeks afterward i was still weighing myself like a hundred times a day after it was it was horrible yeah poor jean had to hide the scale for a while yeah 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 Yeah, it was pretty bad she didn't i didn't know about the residual stuff until like way afterwards and i i feel very bad i would have i think i would have told you you had to stop the book yeah but the first i've known how truly bad it was yeah but the first two books after the pilot the first two books were so extreme we chose the two most extreme books right off the bat the life-changing magic of tidying up and french women don't get fat and the first weekend of living by um the tidying up book jolent and i were each up for 18 hours a day trying to tidy and so all day saturday and all day sunday tidying and I was on the verge of exhaustion with that, too. I'm like, I already work 60 hours a week. I cannot spend another 60 hours every week working on these books. I'm going to die. I'm going to die if all the books are this hard. And then to follow that up with French women, it was, I really was at a breaking point. I was like, I'm going to, I have to quit this. I cannot do the show. It was a really rough timeline. Yeah, it was a really. (laughs) Looking back. Yeah. And it was a lesson in balance and figuring out, like, okay, you guys are actually living by these books. The rest of us are just, like, enjoying it once a week, you know? (laughs) Like, it's, you know, so it's so trying to figure out, like, balancing the the heavier lift ones with the more fun ones. Yeah, so we realized how to alternate them, not back to back. Um, We have a question back there. Um, So, obviously, I'm not French or woman, but the question I do have is how do you, being that you all are investing so much of your personal lives into these into these books and in your family relationships, how do you decompress from it? Uh, frozen drinks <laughs> and um, when they're allowed. I was gonna say, you know, our at least in our household, it's not like we're recording every single minute, and so we definitely have downtime every day where we're not recording. And as insane as this sounds, I'm kind of a workaholic, so going to work makes me so happy every day, spending time with like my colleagues and so on, and making things that I'm proud of. So um, all of that's good. And then at least once every other week, I just have a complete crash day, as Dean knows. I had one last night where um, <laughs> Dean's laughing. Did I sleep 13 hours? I don't know. I, I Where I just like, I push myself and push myself and push myself, and then there's um, maybe once every other week a crash day where I'm just like I just need to sleep and I sleep for over 12 hours God does that sound unhealthy that sounds really like <laughs> right that I was sounds a, like really that's like that's the problem. only way you can do it like every what's like I, f- I always find like one day because we basically do like two weeks back to back but I essentially always find a day where I don't do anything related to to buy the book just for your own sanity. Yeah, yeah that's just like, like I'm not necessary. reading the new one. I'm not following. Like I just like just try to, you. you know, just order bad food and like do whatever I want for a day. It's usually like a hungover Sunday, but yeah, no, yeah. that's basically what I do. I find the one day, and just then when we get downtime, yeah. I like. The only thing I don't like about this is I really don't like reading in my downtime anymore. <laughs> not that I read a ton, but it's like now if I'm traveling, I just don't want any book as long as like. I don't want a self-help book or like I don't want to have to be beholden to any books, which is sort of a bummer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, but hopefully this, that'll change. <laughs> but this is one reason why our show is in seasons. Uh, many listeners have asked us, why don't you just live all the books back to back to back for the next 10 years? Like we don't un- like why did you have to go on a break between season 1 and we season 2? Sanity. And the break we took was so brief. It was 8 weeks and we still released a bonus episode every other week. And so um it was amazing how many people still wrote in and said, 
you're not releasing enough episodes. You need to make more episodes, and which made us happy. We're like, yay, people yay. are listening, but also, also yeah. like, we're gonna die if. <laughs> well, we hopefully they're watching the live stream right now, and, and <laughs> now, now they how, get how it. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Was there a question right there? So you describe approaching the books with a, a healthy dose of skepticism, and yet you also describe being very caught up in in what the books kind of. Um, asking you to do or how, how to live. Is, will you say it's that the books are kind of targeting areas of vulnerability, or is there something about the writing or the way they're programmed that draws you in? I mean, what makes them so engrossing, even though from the start, outside, you might be saying, oh, you know, bullshit? Oh, I think there are so, <laughs> there are so many levels. <laughs> they're definitely the vulnerability. Like, yeah, you're, like, you're not successful enough. You're not skinny enough. You're not blank enough. And then to top it all off, all the people writing these books, this is what I think about a lot, which, which I'm fascinated by, is the people writing these books, it's also just a study in like what a super extreme person is. Because the person who's writing this book has spent you know, more time thinking about one tiny aspect of life than like so many other people have ever spent. You know, they spend so much time making up a method like it's just these these are like diaries of crazy people yeah <laughs> but they're masquerading or not necessarily always masquerading but they're they're presenting themselves as experts about an area again that like we're always insecure about so it's just this perfect storm of like how can you not look away for me at least for me it's because i signed up for the show and i always do what i say and <laughs> yeah chris is just really good at like and, holding up for end of the deal and <laughs> When we read a book, I immediately write down every single rule in the book, and I follow those rules because that's what I said I would do. Wow. That's it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, and I love you, and I would do anything yeah, for no, you. There's that too. <laughs> I'm not fishing for compliments. I just, <laughs> just hope you find some of this interesting. <laughs> All of them are interesting because I think yeah. they say so much about what it is to be a human and right. what it is to be a woman because a lot of these books are targeting women specifically. Mm -hmm. And Jolenta and I have talked plenty about this on other shows we've been guests on about the fact that women have in so many places and so so much of history been left out of traditional health and wellness and science. So frequently a study will be done and it's like, oh, we need 100 men between the ages of 18 and 35 and this and that. And so, so often women have been left out of that science and those conversations. And so it makes sense that a wellness movement, a self-help movement kind of grew out of that for women because women need somewhere to go to be taken seriously. And of course, a lot of women are going to be drawn to something that says, I'm listening to you and I take your body seriously and I take your insecurity seriously and so on. So it's hard not to look at these books and think about what they say about us as Americans and about us as women. And I also just, I love the idea that we can all be anything we want to be, which is such a wonderful part of American mythology, whether it's true or not. And so much of what self-help is shilling is that same mythology of Horatio Alger or any of our forefathers who say, you can come here and be anything. And something I bring up all the time lately because I love Meghan Markle and <laughs> Harry, um, and I am so excited about this royal wedding. Don't stop with the I Markle. Cannot, I am so excited. <laughs> By the way, I have a new podcast starting tomorrow that oh God, launches tomorrow called When Meghan Met Harry that I'm co-hosting also. But <laughs> what w one thing I want to point out about Meghan Markle, and one reason I love her so much, Versus <laughs> Harry, who's kind of a freeloader. I, I love him too, oh, but he's kind of, but he's like, he's unemployed and living off of his parents, right? He's and, a prince. But <laughs> the British press love to make fun of Meghan Markle because they say, oh, she comes from a middle class background and look where she grew up. It may as well be the ghetto. Yes, she's famous and she's beautiful, and yes, she's a millionaire. But look where she came from. And in America, we, we spin the story. We're right. like. Look, she came from a middle class background and then she became a UN ambassador and a millionaire and stars on a TV show for six years. Look at where she started and look where she ended up. Whereas in the UK they say, look at where she started as if that's a bad thing. And I love that self-help books, I'm bringing it full circle. So self-help <laughs> books. <laughs> self-help books kind of show that thing that I love about Meghan Markle. And, it, and I know it can't always be true. I know about systemic racism, I know about all of the issues with class, with taxes, with power structures. I'm not saying that anybody really can be anything they want to be, but I love that idea that we can try. That's 
beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> um, my back has been turned to this region. Do any of you have questions or comments that you want to throw in there? No? Yes, right back there. I have a question. I, I, I know, Kirsten, you were just sort of addressing this just now, but um, I, I always love at the end of each episode that moment where you guys are sort of trying to unpack the kind of key insight or lesson or takeaway for the listener, uh, whether it is something gleaned from the experience or a reaction against the book, right? So I'm just kind of curious relatedly if there's taken as a whole, this podcast, if there's something that you sort of somebody who's listening to that sort of all of these episodes collectively if there's something that you either have learned yourself right or or relatedly sort of a key insight that you hope listeners take away from listening to the podcast as a whole oh i feel like we've actually learned a lot during oh, the show I don't know. you i feel like it changes every week <laughs> <laughs> um i just think that I, I wish more of us were taught to believe in ourselves and to trust ourselves because there are a lot of charlatans out there telling right. us not to believe in ourselves and to believe them instead. You don't have to believe them. Some of them have good things to say, but you should believe in yourself first. And to be kind to yourself, a lot of these books are not showing kindness. I think a lot of them are being kind of mean-spirited, actually, that they're putting you down, that they're calling you mediocre. We'll get to <laughs> we that book. We just lived by one. The first <laughs> step so was mad. just, admit you're mediocre. <laughs> and that book made me so mad. Nobody, nobody is mediocre. Nobody in this room is mediocre. You're all amazing. Like, I just hate that. I want, I, I want to believe that the best thing to believe is that you're okay already and to forgive yourself for the ways that maybe you haven't been okay in the past and do the best you can. Right. I mean, yeah, weirdly, I guess my first reaction, my first gut answer to this question was to, yeah, I guess I'm learning more and more about trusting your gut and um, not necessarily taking experts for their word. Also, just unpacking what makes an expert an expert. Uh, John like, Gray. <laughs> yeah. What makes a doctor a doctor in some cases, like <laughs> fake PhDs. Uh, what was that? Men are from Mars. That was, oh, yeah, that was Men are from PhD. Mars. And then the secret had metaphysicians from the University of Sedona, Sedona which is right. not actually a I school. Love, now I <laughs> want to go to the University of Sedona. You so can't. It's bad. not a school. Um, no, but so definitely trusting your gut and, like, when you're faced with people saying, like, you should want this and you should look like this. It's, it's how far do you buy in? What's your limit for, you know, everything from tidying to eating whole foods to like waking up early like what are your personal limits what and yeah trusting your gut when something super works for you even if it's not mainstream even if you believe in like past lives and future healing oh yeah just I one of the got books something we out of that book yeah yeah she got way more out of it than she expected but yeah so just trusting your guts on all level when to like pump the brakes and when to like lean into something that might be new and scary I mean, this is something I think about is like uh, at, for the series as a whole is like their individual character arc development, right? Like it's not just episode by episode, but it's like who they are and what they're learning big picture. And so when I think about this, I'm like, well, is, is Jolene, you know, you're the seeker, right? Are you ever going to find that thing that you're looking for? And Kristen yeah. is kind of the support. And, and like, is she ever going to like believe, you know? And, and I sort of feel like every episode is like they, they get a little bit closer to this thing that like could keep going on for as long as we are, you know, supporting this podcast and hopefully for forever, as long as you guys can stand it. Um, and that, and that, you know, that, that, yeah, that you sort of get a little bit closer to that each time. And that's the thing that kind of keeps there. There's like a, I don't know. I like to think about the whole package right. that way. I'm glad someone is <laughs> thinking that's my job. Well, I think we'll all be listening for that hot tub scene or bathtub scene oh. going forward. Is there anything else that you can tease um, either that, that you know is coming or that you that you hope will be coming in the future? You know how Dean is like the greatest husband in the whole world and I love him endlessly and he's perfect? There is <gasps> a moment true. when I am not nice to him. Oh, whoa. <laughs> okay, okay. There's a moment where Dean may or may, may not be perfect as opposed <laughs> to just hands down perfect. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we'll wait for that. Um, we were going to end by listening to uh, all of you in the confession corner out there. And I actually forget the exact wording of the prompt. Beth, what was the exact wording? How far have you gone for self? What's the most extreme thing 
you have done for self-improvement. Okay, so we're gonna hear from you now. I wanted to have better balance. So I thought the best way to do that was to always walk on the curb wherever I went. And I did that for about three years until one time coming home from a bar, I decided I'd walk down a wall in a park on uh, like descending hillside and fell off the other side and broke my ankle. No. Oh. I made it a complete New Year's resolution to act the same around both genders. And it was a big mission in my life. Purchase these really weird socks where your toes are individually covered and it has a tacky <laughs> bottom for some bar exercise class that I never took. I skipped class for an entire day and went to a meditation room for four hours. I left my husband. Oh. 20 yoga sessions in one month. Quitting my job, I worked too much and now I make podcasts, which is really cool. Cut my hair and cried about it. <laughs> Yeah. I also cut my hair and cried about it. I'm crying about it. But I spent a week or a weekend at Esalen. When I was looking to do some self improvement, I actually went there to learn how to garden. To lock myself into a closet to try to overcome my fear of being in confined spaces. Ooh, nope. Once I gargled coconut oil, <laughs> decide that I want a divorce. Yeah. I went to Mount Everest, um, which is not something that somebody should do uh, on a whim, uh, <laughs> but it was amazing. <laughs> to join Toastmasters, which is very boring, but I was really scared of public speaking, like I think a lot of Americans. For senior prom, I tried Beyonce's lemonade diet, which Ooh. was 14 days of lemonade, cayenne pepper, yeah. and Maple honey, syrup. and I gained three pounds. Reading Marie Kondo's Magical Art of Tidying Up, I decided to fold my socks instead of balling them. I didn't hear them say, or maybe they forgot to say, that you have to dilute it with water. And so I just got up in the morning, did my daily routine, took a shot of apple cider vinegar with no water in it, and it burned my esophagus. In high school, I really wanted a six pack, so I worked out my abs so much that I got a hernia. <laughs> The sweat lodge. I don't recommend it. Well, that was great. Oh my gosh, those are Thank incredible. You. Wow. <laughs> Thank you guys for sharing all of that and for coming and, and discussing this episode with us. And thank uh, you guys for, for being up here and for the show. Oh, thanks thank so much you. for having us. Yeah.